Um, hello, my name is Dr. Paul Richardson, and it's my pleasure to update um, everyone on um, the uh, results of our first in human phase one study of the novel cell mod agent uh, CC92480, which I'll call 480 going forward for simplicity, which we combined with dexamethasone to treat patients with uh, highly resistant relapse and refractory multiple myeloma. Um, by way of background, um, 480 is a potent novel cerebral E3 ligase modulator, as we call it, and this is a so-called cell mod, um, that was specifically designed for the rapid and maximal degradation of uh, particular target proteins, and in this particular uh, context, um, so-called Icaros and Aolos. Um, these are proteins that are absolutely um, fundamental in myeloma biology from the standpoint of the um, not only targeting uh, actually the disease itself, but also modulating the immune response to it. And what we showed with 480 preclinically in a nutshell was that um, it enhanced direct antimyeloma and immune stimulatory activities. Uh, and at the same time, when we looked at both lenalidomide and uh, pomalidomide resistant uh, cell lines, we found it was able to convincingly overdrive um, the resistance inherent in those to traditional imids. So um, this particular cell mod um, builds on the potency already established from another cell mod, CC92220, or so-called ibertamide, and 480 is even stronger. Uh, and it has a very uh, uh, short and uh, uh, intense substrate degradation efficiency, which means it uh, degrades um, Icaros and Aolos very rapidly. Uh, and this results in a very potent apoptosis uh, in myeloma. And to give you some flavor of that, where pomalidomide at a micromolar concentration um, will induce uh, uh, apoptosis um, at around a factor of one um, in the same model system uh, um, for 80 at even lower concentrations, uh, 0.1 micromolar uh, can induce uh, around a 7.5 fold increase in terms of apoptosis induction kinetics. So these are really very potent drugs and quite distinct from the immunomodulatory class, in fact, in that regard. Now, with this sort of background of very uh, um, potent preclinical information, we conducted a, a, a very um, uh, ambitious uh, novel phase one study across multiple centers, both in the United States and Europe. And we explored um, various schedules of 480. One was a continuous schedule and the other one was an intensive schedule. And we used pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic monitoring um, to optimize dosing schedule accordingly. And then once we had done that, we, we are now pursuing what's called part two, which is a cohort expansion. Um, just to sort of summarize how this evolved, we looked first at a continuous schedule of 10 out of 14 days across a month. And we arrived by virtue of what we did with our blood testing and marrow testing um, at a 21 out of 28 day schedule being best. We were able to show deep effect on ALOS degradation but we needed longer continuous breaks. So that's why we came to the 21 days on and one, and one week off. On the intensive schedule, we we're able to also show that you could really profoundly degrade the target protein ALOS, but longer days uh, were required uh, um, on treatment to prevent the rebound of myeloma. So this taught us an awful lot about the value of continuous dosing. Now, on the data we presented, there were 76 patients in all um, that we, we, we presented. Remember, this is an ongoing trial, so there will be more information from this during the expansion phase to follow. But still, with 76 patients um, treated, we were able to, to share with um, uh, our audience the results of this. It was important to note um, that this um, patient population were enriched for extramedullary plasma cytoma. About 37% of them had this, and they also had advanced disease. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that Median number of prior treatments was six. Um, and in terms of their prior treatment characteristics, um, they uh, basically were so-called triple class refractory in at least half of the patients. Um, almost all of the patients were refractory to either len, pomalidomide, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, or both. Um, and in fact, 70% um, were refractory to um, monoclonal antibody therapy. Everyone had received prior proteasome inhibition and uh, actually 76% of the patients had already had a stem cell transplant. So this would be considered a very high risk population. And currently at the moment, about a third of patients are ongoing in terms of treatment. And for those who've stopped treatment, the majority have been for progressive disease. But what's really important is that none of the patients have discontinued because of toxicity from 480, which is really a key signal 
terms of the tolerability of a drug. And in fact, in terms of dose reductions, we've only had to do that in 22% of patients, which in itself is encouraging. Now, what about side effects? Well, we've recognized that the most important have been neutropenia and low platelet count. And we have, uh, uh, importantly, um, been able to use GCSF once uh, that we were able to doc document um, the initial safety in the first cycle. And what's encouraging about that is that we've had very low rates of infections overall, um, and especially serious ones. And in that regard, we've had only about 15% of patients experience pneumonia, which is sometimes a big problem um, with advanced uh, disease in this setting um, for a variety of drugs that we may use, such as antibodies. Um, what's also important is that in terms of febrile neutropenia, um, we only have um, about 8% of patients uh, developing febrile neutropenia. And of those, in fact, only four of the patients developed, um, uh, great, in fact, I apologize, only five of the patients developed um, serious uh, uh, febrile neutropenia. So of 76 patients, when we did see some febrile neutropenia, it was at a very low rate. And the other side effect was thrombocytopenia. And importantly, <coughs> that proved manageable and there were no cases of severe bleeding. And the other important point to share is we only had four patients with peripheral neuropathy, which is a very low number, it's only 5%. And only one patient had a deep vein thrombosis, which we thought was also encouraging. Now, using our, our deep, deep, uh, dose limiting toxicities by dose level, we were able to show here that neutropenia was really the major issue. We did, interestingly, encounter a couple of patients who had had some inflammation of the lung, so-called pneumonitis, but this was grade two and readily manageable with appropriate supportive care and dose reduction. And our dose that we determined to be maximally tolerated and, and most active was one milligram. So nice and simple, one milligram. And the best schedule was three weeks out of four, 21 out of 28. And we did some, as I mentioned, some important uh, translational work using uh, blood testing to evaluate the effects of the drug, um, both on the myeloma and indeed on what we call the pharmacokinetics in, in, in each patient. And we were able to show that systemic exposure was increased in a dose consistent fashion. And very importantly, this correlated with the pharmacodynamic effects of the drug. We were also able to demonstrate how myeloma light chains might go up and down at lower doses and on different schedules versus being much more sustained and controlled and with the more continuous schedules. So this allowed us to confirm that one milligram maximized ALOS degradation and that we needed um, 21 out of 28 day schedules in order to sustain deep uh, and sustained drops in myeloma light chain. So that was very encouraging. Now, what about the responses? Well, we were very encouraged by this. If you looked at all 76 patients, recognizing that our starting doses when we first embarked at the very beginning were as low as 0.1 milligram. If you look at the overall response rates, um, about 21% of patients had a PR or better. Um, which in such a heavily pretreated patient population is, is important. But what was particularly striking, once you got to the doses that we knew were optimal in terms of tolerability, this is the milligram, one milligram dosing, in the 10 out of 14 day schedule twice a month, we, our response rate jumped to 40%. And then very excitingly, for those patients treated with the one milligram dose three weeks on and one week off, our response rate jumped to 55%. And remember, this is just a pill. Uh, taken once a day, three weeks on and one week off. Now, what we were able to show was that these responses were very durable, and especially if you were at the one milligram dose on the three weeks on and one week off, that these were sustained, which was encouraging. And when we looked at patients who had extramedullary disease, we were very pleased to see that one milligram dose was clearly active. And we not only had very good partial responses in this group of patients, as well as PRs, but we also had complete responses. And um, I think this is terribly important because extramedullary disease in this population is a major challenge. So our conclusions were that 480 is a, a really the most potent cell mod currently under study in myeloma. Um, not only has this remarkably potent preclinical profile, but this translated into, uh, into, into, into patient benefit as reflected by a manageable safety profile in our patients. And most importantly, uh, the establishment of a dose and schedule, one milligram daily, three weeks on and one week off, and really promising activity uh, in patients refractory to standard care. So they were patients who were refractory to pomalidomide, refractory to monoclonal antibody therapy, refractory to proteasome inhibitors, and all three. And very importantly, um, our patients who had what's so-called extramedullary disease appeared to benefit, which was particularly gratifying to see. 
So in terms of future directions, the study is now ongoing with the dose expansion cohort, which is one milligram three weeks on and one week off. And we're now looking at combination strategies with other drugs like bortezomib, um, uh, daratumumab, and other approaches going forward. And we're very hopeful that this will continue um, to, to show great promise in this setting. So I just would like to close by acknowledging all of the investigators on the MM001 study, as it was called. We had uh, participants from Canada, Denmark, Finland, Spain, the United Kingdom, and of course the United States. I'm very grateful to all my colleagues um, for uh, doing such an outstanding job. And I also want to acknowledge our, our sponsor, which was uh, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb Celgene, uh, a remarkable team who were very helpful. And last but no means least, I want to especially acknowledge our patients and families who, who made the study possible. And thank you very much for your kind attention.